Thank you. Well, that took up almost all my time. <laughs> Hello and good afternoon. Um, some of you have probably heard the expression that uh, we don't choose our passion, our passion chooses us. And my passion chose me when I was nine years old. And that passion for outer space exploration when I was nine um, really meant that I didn't have any uh, resources to look at, right? Well, except Walter Cronkite. But uh, <laughs> there wasn't anything else for me to really review or look at. But I did find one great, great book in my school library, and that's this one, The Stars, A New Way to See Them by H.A. Ray. Now, a lot of you know this author. You may not know you know him, but you do. Because H.A., along with his wife Margaret, created Curious George and the Man in the Yellow Hat. More great books. I read all of them. My passion actually really kind of got a hold of me, I think, just over 50 years ago. And I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about, right? That was when my family and I sat in our living room in Oregon and watched Armstrong and Aldrin take the first steps on the moon. And we sat there and we could look at it on the TV and look up from the TV out our picture window and look at the full moon and back of the TV. And it's this incredible juxtaposition that we're looking at the full moon and seeing there are people up there right now walking around on the surface. And ever since then, I cannot get enough of uh, outer space and deep space and thinking about it and working on it. Now I'm going to have, um, uh, hopefully, lots of ideas for you. And I'm going to put them in terms of really two stories, a story of ultimate destruction and a story of ultimate opportunities. But first, I need to get to one really quick, easy question. Why explore space? Right? It actually has a very incredibly simple answer. We have to explore space because if we don't, we all die. Okay? If we do not explore space, Homo sapiens, human beings, will go extinct just like the dinosaurs did. Dinosaurs never had a space plan. We have a chance to do one. Um, so that's kind of the ultimate destruction part of the story. And it really comes out to the death of our sun. Our sun will, is not forever. It'll eventually die out. And we know from observing the universe around us, our galaxy and other galaxies, we know what's going to happen to our sun. We know that in 200 million years from now, life on this planet is going to start to become really, really difficult. We have no choice over that. It's absolute certain we have no defense. In the meantime, in 200 million years, we are also going to be, our planet is the target of asteroids and comets. In the next 200 million years, over 500 asteroids, one kilometer in diameter or larger, will impact our planet, unless we can do something about it. Right now, we have no defense for that. We're working on it. We have to find out where they are, when they're coming, and then figure out what do we do with them if they're, about to look, if they're going to hit the Earth. So unless we have a defense, we're going to be here less than 200 million years. And the destruction of Earth will be our destruction if we remain here. We will be a single planet species. Now with ultimate destruction, nobody likes to talk about that and I don't want to bring the room down, so that's enough of that. <laughs> um, so we have, that, I mean that's very well known. Uh, we know that, we don't need to dwell on it. It's the other one, the ultimate opportunity. An opportunity, I use the word opportunity here where you might be thinking, well what are the problems and the challenges? Well those are opportunities. And this is about imagination, and it's time for you to use your imagination to figure out how we're going to get through all this. So what are some of those obstacles, the challenges? I'm sure we could, you know, if we got together, we could spend the next 200 million years creating 200 million challenges. So I'll just get you started with a couple that I happen to think of, which I think are neat. Um, and you can probably come up with your own, but this will give you kind of an idea about what I'm thinking of. First one is energy. Well, I'm an engineer, so this is the one that occurs to me first. Um, and that is, what's the amount of energy it's going to take to send the world's population to another star? Let's say there's 10 billion people. What's it going to take to send 10 billion people to another star? And I have no clue whatsoever. So then I came back and I said, well, okay, what would it take to send them just to Mars? 
or just to the moon. And still, I fail. I really don't know how much that's going to take. But I can calculate how much energy will it take to send 10 billion people just barely off the Earth's surface. What if we send 10 billion people up to low Earth orbit? Let's send 10 billion people for a massive party on the International Space Station. That's all we're going to send them to. <laughs> to send 10 billion people up to the space station will take seven times the total energy consumption by the world in 2014. Seven times the energy we all consumed over the globe in 2014. Sounds like a bit of a problem. We're going to have to improve on that. That's only to get them to low Earth orbit. So where are we going to send them and how long is it going to take, right? Because we have to send, you know, food and snacks and video games along with them or something so they can, so they can get there. So how long is that going to take? And I don't know where they're going, but let's say we're just going to go to the closest star, the closest star other than our sun. We're going to go to Proxima Centauri, and we're going to go at the speed of the fastest object we've ever sent into the solar system and into, uh, beyond our solar system, and that is Voyager 1, moving now at about 38,000 miles an hour. So these 10 billion people are now going to move at 38,000 miles an hour. They're going to head to the nearest star, and it's going to take them 74,000 Earth years. Two and a half thousand generations just to reach the nearest star. And then the, the question is, well, why can't we pick somebody else? Well, sure, go ahead. I don't know. Where to, we don't know where to send them. Nobody knows. We, you know, if we're looking for habitable planets, habitable, by the way, means not too hot, not too cold, liquid water on the surface. It's why it's called the Goldilocks zone. And if we're going to something like that, we think we may see some planets that are like that, that may be, uh, have liquid water on the surface and that we might be able to live on, but they're a long, long, long ways away. Proxima Centauri, the nearest star, we're not sure it has planets at all. So at this point, we don't know where to send anybody, even if we did have the energy and could figure out a way to do it, and we could go much faster, so it takes, say, only 7,000 years instead of 74,000. And that kind of leads to another good question. First three are technical. These next two are not really technical. And that is, do all 10 billion people get to go? And look, we're going to make that decision. It's inevitable. We will decide who of the Earth's population will get to leave and live. And we're going to decide who has to stay. And there's really only three choices. Either everybody goes, everybody stays, or it's something in between. We're going to decide who gets to make that decision and what the criteria are. These are choices that are coming and we will make one way or another. And that kind of leads to what I think is probably the biggest challenge, maybe. <laughs> yeah. We're not very good at this. Uh, the first three are technical. These, this last one especially, that's human nature. You think 200 million years is a long time and we can wait 199 million? I, I think it may take us 200 million years to be able to figure out how to collaborate with each other. Because we don't, right? So, yeah, you have, to, you have to get a committee of 10 billion members, all who have an equal voice, to agree on how we're going to solve this and who gets to go and who has to stay. So here's my key takeaway. Human beings, homo sapiens, we have to evolve and become an entirely different species. We have to become a spacefaring species. That is, living exclusively in outer space. No planets. For one thing, it takes too long to get there, right? And by the time we've spent two and a half thousand generations living in outer space, why stop? Right? Why do we need another planet? Why do we keep looking for an Earth-like planet to live on? That is the wrong goal. We don't need a duplicate of where we just left. So we're looking at our next evolutionary step. Just as we went from water to land, now we need to move from land into space. And that's what we're going to do, or you know the alternative. And when we get into outer space, we're going to have to figure out how to engineer our bodies. Right? There's some genetics in here that we, right now, we're not capable of really living in space for very long. 
and we're probably going to have to change that. Now, we've taken a great idea from Charles Darwin and really corrupted it, and now we say only the strongest survive. No matter how many sports team coaches say that every weekend, it has no basis in reality. <laughs> and it's not the strongest that survive. It's not the most intelligent that survives. It is the species that is most adaptable to change. That's what survives. Remember, some of you probably do, there's an old adage that after a cataclysmic nuclear war, there would, everything on Earth would be dead except for the cockroaches. <laughs> right? Is it because the cockroaches are the strongest species? No. I pray it is not because they are the most intelligent. <laughs> but cockroaches adapt. They know how to adapt to pretty much anything. That's why they're survivors. Now, this being a university and me being a faculty member here, I have to give you an assignment. It is part of my contract. So here's your assignment. One, spread the word. What kind of word? One, Earth is not our forever home. Two, why do we need to explore space? You all know the answer now. It is very simple. It has nothing to do with Tang and Velcro and all these other things. <laughs> okay? We explore space because we would like to continue to live and not die on one planet so that the universe knows nothing about us. Now, you know, the destruction part is pretty horrible to think about, but the fun part is reimagining what it is like for us to move to outer space and what we have to do and what we are going to do to solve all those problems. Imagine the problems, and then once we do that, we can start imagining the solutions. And finally, I've got to put collaborate up there again because obviously I think it's important, and that's, we're going to have to figure out how to do that too. So, my takeaway, I guess, on one slide. We have to evolve from Homo sapiens to Terra, which is Earthlings, to Homo sapiens to Spatio, or Spacelings. Now, I have one, I guess, final thought. It's really a note of encouragement because I feel like I need a note of encouragement here. Um, you're going to go out next week and work on your assignments, and you'll spread your imagination, use your imagination, and you're going to encounter a lot of negative naysayers and negative Nellies, and here's what I want you to do. You look them right in the eye, and you tell them, you know, with enough thrust, pigs fly just fine. <laughs> so use your imagination and go make pigs fly. Thank you all very much. <laughs>